is the Ferrari 296 GTB, the permanent hardtop version of the diminutive hybrid V6 supercar, what some people would call a baby SF90. It's an 818 brake horsepower missile with retro design touches, the latest technology inside and out, and many of you who have driven or actually own one say it's the best modern Ferrari ever made. It is also the first ever Ferrari badged V6 powered car because of course in the 70s they were badged as Dinos. I've made no secret of my disdain for Ferrari moving to hybrid and full electric powertrains and for me this is the beginning of the end. But I am willing to give it a chance. And I stand here today with an open mind, an open road, and this stunning example in Grigio Silverstone with a Seto Fiorano pack, which has been loaned to the car guys by friend of the channel, David. This is Drive Every Ferrari, and I've never known a more divisive car than this. There are viewers of this channel that say it's Ferrari's best car ever, and there are those who say it's disappointing. Who is right? Let's find out. This week on Drive Every Ferrari, I'm gonna find out what the future of Ferrari really looks like. The way the internal combustion engine and electric motor interact, the space age interior, and what it's like to drive. And for a long while, we all thought the 296 would actually be badged a Dino. I mean, how cool would that have been? Instead, we got a new car with a new engine and an uncharacteristic whiff of uncertainty from Ferrari. Will the V6 engine ultimately kill the V8 or will they coexist in the future? This is a car I get asked to review by you guys more than any other, and so I'm glad to finally bring it to the channel. I'm also going to explore something a bit more personal. Will the 296 GTB convert me to a hybrid or electric future? Could I possibly live with this kind of Ferrari? Will I ever buy a new Ferrari not exclusively powered by an internal combustion engine? The 296 GTB was launched in June 2021, a two-seater Berlinetta with a mid-rear mounted 3.0-litre V6 petrol engine and a plug-in FEV electric motor, which generates a total of 818 brake horsepower, 653 from the internal combustion engine and an additional 165 from the electric powertrain. Being the very latest piece of Ferrari machinery, the 296 GTB is of course festooned with technology, acronyms, and motorsport-derived magic. You get side slip control, SSC, a FEV powertrain, ABS Evo, E-Manatino, a six-way chassis dynamic sensor, transition manager actuator, aero brake calipers, SCM FRS, Magnetor heliological dampers, MGUK, and an E-Diff. Whew, now that's a mouthful. All of this is designed to make the 296 more powerful, more agile, more comfortable, more controllable, safer, and more usable day to day. All indications are that this should be the best all-round Ferrari for all conditions, and importantly, also for the future. So the first thing you notice, it feels and it looks small. It's of course 15 millimeters shorter than previous Berlinettas, but something about the whole design language makes this feel like a teeny, teeny little car. And thankfully, it goes against the current trend of supercar bloat. It's far from being one of Ferrari's modern design triumphs, in my opinion, especially from the rear. But I do appreciate that many of you feel differently and many of you feel the same. That's the beauty, folks, of opinion. It looks smaller than the F8 and the 488, and there's enough of the SF90 and the 250LM to make it distinctive. The compact cabin helps to emphasize the short wheelbase, 50 millimeters shorter than the previous GTBs, and it means your eyes are drawn to those muscular rear wheel arches and flat rear deck. Unusually for the GTB, Ferrari has opted to break up the lines from the roof to the rear engine cover, and that makes it look a lot more like 
previous GTSs. It gives the appearance of a car permanently leaping forward, which for a Ferrari Berlinetta is a good thing. And what's this? Yes, it's an active mobile wing, and this one is designed specifically to increase downforce, resulting in an additional 100 kilograms at high speeds. So let's have a look around this 296 GTB, and let's talk about the styling and the exterior generally, and then we'll get into the cabin. As you can see, David's GTB is painted in Grigio Silverstone, that's grey to you and me, and the all-important Assetto Fiorano stripe. I don't really agree with the costs of the paint on this car. Let's face it, it is ludicrous because you are talking 7,000 quid for the grey and another 14,000 for the stripe. That's too much. And he's opted for 20 inch forged diamond wheels with Giallo Modena brake calipers. It's a classic look, it's understated, but it seems to suit this car quite well. Now you can see David's car has an awful lot of exterior carbon. He's ticked pretty much every box. So you've got carbon all along the side skirts and the kick plates. You've also got carbon all around the rear diffuser. So all of that section, including this lip here around the active spoiler. And crucially, this section here on the engine lid, which looks particularly fantastic in carbon. You'll also notice here what they call the tea tray is all in carbon here. You also have this little bridge here, which you don't really notice that much actually, but when you get close to it, you can, and you can see it houses the third brake light. You've then got on this car a uh, Lexan rear screen, so you can look in on the engine. But what you really notice standing next to it is just how flat this whole section is. And that combined with these buttresses and these wide haunches really helps to accentuate that 250 LM design language that they borrowed. And also it helps to make the car look lower and smaller. The rear view in the wing mirrors is dominated by these colossal vents through here to the engine. Unfortunately, they do look a little bit like those hand dryers you get in service stations, but they are at least functional and they do, of course, when combined with this huge hump here, look quite historic. Brake cooling comes from the SF90, which includes using these same aero calipers, which actually have ducts built into the casings. And the brake cooling intakes are in the front headlights. These are the vents for the radiators for the hybrid system. And it's part of the reason why you don't have lots of vents on the actual engine cover itself. But for me, and I've said it before, I'm not a big fan of the rear of the 296 or the GTS. I just find the whole back of this car looks far too much like a Corvette, especially with these rather strange lights. I do like the fact there's just a single exhaust. I think that's really cool. And when we talk about the engine noise later on, the noise that comes out of that is really special. But even tastefully specced and dosed in carbon like this, yeah, I'm still not a huge fan of the rear. I mean, there's only a few years difference between these two cars, but they couldn't be more different now. Look how more space age and sharp the 296 is compared to the Pista, which we all thought was aggressive and angry back then. But I mean, look at the difference now. Also bear in mind, this is a spider. So of course it looks even more like the 296 GTB's new rear treatment. Yes, definitely the Pista is noticeably longer. It really is fascinating having these two cars together. I mean, you can see how much more I love the back of the Pista than the 296. I mean, this is a work of art, this, yeah. Less said about that, the better. And how about that for a monumental step forward in Ferrari design evolution. Look at the difference, particularly the front end. Obviously, Ferrari's dropped that S duct that made the Pista so distinctive. Completely different treatment to both cars. Quick word about door handles. I didn't think it was possible to come up with worse door handles than the ones on the Pista and the 488, but Ferrari has managed it because now we've got what looks like a flush door handle, which you actually have to push your hands in in order to activate. So your hand has to push into this slat. There's lots of edges and it feels like you're gonna nip yourself all around it. It's not very nice at all. And you end up scraping your fingers on the edge, holding down to then pull the door open whilst you're clasping, in this case, what is a red hot piece of body in order to open it. So this is quite invasive and not particularly pleasant. Pushing down is pretty horrible. My knuckles have just scraped on the inside. I'm now holding red hot material and I'm now pulling it out. And, and then worse, when you 
pull your hand out, you end up scratching the whole top of your hand and pinching the inner part of your fingers. It's just horrible. Here is the 296 GTB's three litre V6 mid rear mounted engine. And what's really cool about this one is that it's a 120 degree configuration, which allows the turbos to be mounted between the cylinders and therefore sits far lower in the engine, making the engine even more compact. The headline stats are of course pretty impressive. 0 to 60 comes in 2.9 seconds, 0 to 124 miles an hour though, 7.3 seconds. 818 brake horsepower with the electric engine and the petrol engine, 653 brake horsepower just for the petrol alone. Top speed, 205 miles an hour, that's 330 kilometers an hour. It's a 2992cc V6 twin turbo. Peak torque, 546 foot pounds, which is 740 Newton meters. And the weight, typically the Achilles heel of the hybrid vehicle, well, it's 1470 kilograms dry. So that's going to be around about 1600 with all the fluids and gubbins on board. Now for a hybrid engine, something like this, it's actually not too bad. That's actually a lot lighter than I was expecting. But then of course, something like the SF90 has also got the four wheel drive system as well. As is the tradition with Ferrari, the name is derived from its engine. So 2992cc capacity V6 becomes 296. Ferrari is rightly proud of this move to the wide V6 because not only does it help satisfy the eco agenda, it also harks back to the 246 SP of 1961 and also the 120 V6 powered 1961 156 Formula One car that won the Constructors' Championship. But of course, the real story with the 296 engine, like the SF90, is the addition of a hybrid plug-in architecture, mating the internal combustion engine with a rear-wheel drive only FEV, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Like many of you, I was horrified at the prospect of a hybrid Ferrari. But if you treat the electric motor as nothing more than an assist to the petrol engine to help swell the torque curve, it becomes less offensive. And it does give you a useful modern day stealth mode in towns and cities. The rear mounted electric motor called a motor generator unit kinetic, MGU-K, is a dual rotor single stator axial flux motor snappy, generates 165 brake horsepower on its own, and it's derived from Formula One. It recharges itself on the move, which means you don't have to keep the car plugged in overnight if you don't want to. It gives you a 15.5 mile range, which is 25 kilometers, which is enough to get you in and out of modern cities or to the local shops. And its compact size configuration, together with the new eight speed triple dry plate compact clutch, allowed Ferrari to shorten the 296's wheelbase. The electric motor and petrol engine communicate with each other via a transition manager actuator, TMA, in order to generate the full 818 brake horsepower or to cut all emissions and run on electric power only. Developed in-house at Ferrari, the TMA is a particularly important piece of technology because the smooth transition between ice and electric power is key in a luxury vehicle. If the transmission is too clunky, the car will not feel futuristic or high quality and it will totally ruin the experience. This was particularly noticeable for me when I drove the McLaren Artura, where the switch from petrol to electric was so brutal and so ungainly and obvious, it spoiled the whole experience. One minute I was driving a McLaren and then with one brutal clunk, I was driving a milk float. It was horrible. Okay, let's talk about the Assetto Fiorano pack. Literally, Fiorano trim. And Fiorano is, of course, Ferrari's longtime in-house test circuit. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's the track pack. This car has it, and many of them do. And initially, you could tell instantly because it means you get these dramatic 250 LM inspired decals on the car, notably this enormous front anchor here. However, you can actually specify to have Assetto Fiorano without the stripes. And like the Speciali and Pista, stripeless track pack cars are considered just a little bit cooler and more understated. Not to me though, because if you want to have a track version of a car, I want it to look like a track car. And the stripe does that. 
The Assetto Fiorano pack costs <gasps> £26,000 for the 296, and that's not including the stripe. And it gives you fixed multi-matic dampers from the race cars, and it also means there's no front lift available. You do get carbon fibre aerodynamic parts on the front, extensive additional carbon fibre throughout the car, plus remodelled lighter door panels and optional Lexan glass on the rear screen. Due to the suspension changes, the Assetto Fiorano makes the 296 a very stiff and hard riding car, so I'm intrigued to see how livable it is every day. <laughs> Now the cabin is based on the same digital interface as the SF90, but softened slightly. And there's no denying it is stylish and futuristic. When I tested the Ferrari Roma, I found the haptic feedback controls to be overly fussy, needlessly complicated, prone to pressing in error, and a step too far. It's rubbish. Just because a car has an electric motor, why does everything have to be digital. The 296 GTB has four power modes accessed using the brand new E-Manatino, in addition to the standard suite of dynamic driving modes on the regular Manatino. E-Drive turns off the petrol engine entirely, giving you a 15 and a half mile range and a maximum speed of 84 miles an hour. That's 135 kilometers an hour. Hybrid is the mode that the car starts in, and it has both the petrol engine and electric motor working in efficient unison, including charging the battery. Performance means the petrol engine is always on and supplemented by the electric motor at full power, and qualify mode gives maximum performance, but limited battery recharging. One of the first things you notice is that when the car has not been turned on yet, the controls all disappear. You have to remember the haptic stuff just sits on black plates that you don't even notice when they're turned off. So without power, it actually looks incredibly minimalist in here. The seats on this model, as you can see here, these ones have got carbon surround, carbon racing seats. They are very comfortable and extremely cool looking. The central column, which you don't really need in a car like this because it's rear wheel drive and rear engine. This has got the same Chrome SF90 Roma controls on it. So you can access the reverse gear from here, auto manual, and also the launch control. The electric window buttons are located down here, perilously close I've found to the buttons here in Chrome. So if you're not paying attention, you might accidentally flick it into manual or launch mode rather than opening the window it's pretty spacious in here. It's quite cool and space age looking. Everything is squat and very Cylon. And I have to say, it's actually quite beautiful. I know I bang on all the time about the simplicity of the 458 Italia's cabin, but this is kind of the same, but with added Buck Rogers. One thing I will highlight, and I have to say I really hate, is the fact that Ferrari has now gone, rather than conventional door handles, it's gone for a button to open the door. And the problem with buttons to open doors is, what happens if you have a catastrophic power failure? How do you get out of the car? I had a similar thing on my McLaren 675LT, and if the battery goes or there's something wrong there, you are trapped and you need a manual release. I can't see a manual release. In order to start the car, you put your foot on the brake and then you press the touch pad engine start stop. And you get a sort of space age noise and suddenly the digital dash comes alive because remember, this whole area of dash is just one digital screen and you can configure it in pretty much any way you want. It's exceptionally cool, very complicated, also, the steering wheel, which had nothing on it up until now, all of a sudden has loads of controls because they're all haptic. Is that this? Blimey, that's quite terrifying. So there's a quite loud buzzing noise which has come on, which is presumably the engine waking itself up or it's preparing the electric motor or something, but it's pretty terrifying. I thought someone had just started up a lawnmower over here. Now on the left hand side, we've got the climate control buttons, which when you touch them, you get a little click to say that you've touched something. Now there's no idea at all what I've done. You have to actually look inside this main display to see a tiny readout showing the temperature. I have no idea why you couldn't just have the temperature 
in this section. It makes no sense at all why you press something here and then you've got to look here to see what's going on. It's the same thing for a lot of the other controls. When you change the Manatino, the proper Manatino, to a different race mode, rather than telling you what the race modes are on the actual Manatino, as they have done since the 430, you have to then look up on the screen to see what mode you're in makes no sense. I don't know why you need to do two things. Now obviously you get the new style Ferrari key. See there, a little lozenge like that. Reminds me a little bit of the emotion control unit that you got in Aston Martins, but thankfully you don't have to push it into the dashboard like you did with the Aston. You actually just put it there into this little sheath. Steering wheel itself is quite small actually. Feels smaller than the equivalent 458 or Pista, but it has so many controls on it. The new and improved indicators, which work really, really well. You've also got then haptic voice controls. No doubt when I sweep my fingers across it, it changes the displays. And you also got the old style Manatino, which as I said before, has nothing written on it. Now the e-Manatino that you got here, you actually have to touch it and it will then illuminate. But the problem is it illuminates and selects. So you, what you really want to do is brush to, show, to make them come alive, and then you want to activate it. But it doesn't, it just goes straight to activation. So if you're driving along at the motorway and you're in qualifying and you want to change it maybe to hybrid and you accidentally press the wrong bit to um, electric only, it will just go straight to that mode. When you do change it to the electric mode, you get a far more funky thing in place of a rev counter because of course you don't need revs, do you, when you're in electric. So overall, I would have to say it's a really, cool place to be. It's got a lot of technology, a bit too much technology. I think some of it is frankly unnecessary, but it is sort of state of the art. And obviously also we don't have that horrendous big stuck on tablet that you get in the Roma. Everything's done through this new dashboard. I think it's now time to drive it and take this car out and find out once and for all whether I can possibly get my head around a hybrid Ferrari. Is it something I could ever see myself owning? Does it work? Let's just find out, shall we? So we're now in full electric mode and... Oh, oh now, now that's strange. So this is the first time I've ever driven a Ferrari that is being powered by electricity, if you don't count the Testarossa J. And away we go. Here we are, full electric mode in a Ferrari. I just, I mean, what am I doing, frankly? What a strange sensation. I guess it's good for going into cities, it's good for creeping around if you don't want to wake the neighbours first thing in the morning. Now, when you're in that hybrid mode, what you have to do is give it a bit of a squirt on the accelerator and it will then awaken the petrol engine. Oh, ah, there we go, there we go. The thing that happens now though, is that if you're in hybrid mode, if you coast, you take off the accelerator and you start to coast, um, it will just kick back into hybrid. So it's kind of like having a moving stop-start function. And if you can remember my views on stop-start, uh, that's probably the worst thing I can ever think of, is to constantly have the engine cutting out. Why are you trying to, why, stop it, stop trying to do input, stop it. Right, so, okay, first of all, we've discovered what makes haptic controls the worst thing in the world, and that's because some of them are being pressed without me even realizing it. So there's some kind of voice thing going on over here, which I just can't, just cannot get out of. It's just cycling it. So we just have to try and ignore that. It's very distracting. So I'm threading it through quite a small little town at the moment and it feels tiny. This car feels really manageable and placeable on the road, which is just what you want from a Ferrari. There's been such a trend of making these things bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. And it's just refreshing to have a car that's a hybrid, not weighing two tons, and also one that's actually smaller than the outgoing car. But the benefit is that the 296 feels pretty light on the road, the responses are light, it, it reacts quickly, and it feels quite nippy and agile. And visibility is good. Over the, from the rear screen, all I can see is the smooth bump of that engine lid. It really is quite futuristic and pleasing. 
Now I'm not a big fan of the paddles on this car. They are a bit too meaty. There's a bit too much weight to them. So they're not like the usual snick, snick, snick that you expect from Ferrari in say the Pista or in the 458s. They're more mechanical, a bit more um, oil riggy. But despite being relatively hard, it is well damped. I'm not grounding out on anything, even though this is the Assetto Fiorano and there's no lift kit, it doesn't feel like I'm in danger of grounding it out on any of the surfaces or drives I've been on so far. I'm really gonna have to turn this into manual mode now using one of these um, chrome looking buttons. They are, I have to say, they do feel a little bit cheap to use. They look fantastic, it's all very Buck Rogersy, but I kind of just wish they felt like metal and not plastic. Now we've got so many displays that it is a bit bewildering, but the fact that you can change one display to dominate the entire dashboard, the fact that you can configure it is, it is fantastic actually. Out of all the systems I've tried in different cars and current supercars, Ferrari's one I think is the best. It's the highest quality, it's the crispest, and it's the one that's got the best balance of functionality and visual flair. When you accelerate in this car, you get a extremely creamy roar. It is so much more refined than the F8 or the 488 Pista. And you get a slight wisp as well. It's not an obvious turbo sound. It's sort of more special than that. So the combination of those two things it's pretty cool actually. This car's got a heads up display which when you consider the fact that it tells you what the miles an hour are digitally right in the middle of the rev counter, literally three centimetres below it, is entirely redundant. But for some reason it's an option. Oh yeah, the steering is phenomenal. It's so pin sharp that you just, oh, you just show it a corner and it just flies round it. It's ridiculous. And yes, it is very firm. It's a very, very firm one. Remember this is a Seto Fiorano, so it's even stiffer than normal. So I'm putting it into wet mode, but it is still very bouncy. Here we go then, open road. Let's see what this uh, 296 can do. of the accelerator and you are flying past illegal speeds. That is sensational, but perhaps even more blown away by the noise because it's just so smooth. It's nothing like as raw or aggressive as the Pista. It's a beautiful, smooth growl with the very hint of turbocharged power behind it. It's so refined, no wonder they call this a Piccolo V12, a, a sort of mini V12, because it is, it just feels like a V12 engine. It's, it's astounding. Why has it taken me so long to drive this car? And now we come into a little town and we don't want to scare the neighbors. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put it in electric mode. There you go. And here I am saving the planet with my beautiful quiet electric power the only problem is is that the cyclist ahead of me doesn't even know i'm here so he's going to jump out of his skin when i go past him in a minute this is what i expected the future to be like look at that it's like i'm driving a rolls royce it's so quiet and then I waken up the beast because we're getting to the end of it and here comes the beast and now I'm in beast mode. Oh. It's a lovely combination and I have to say the transition between the powertrains is completely seamless and completely wonderful. This is a 
special thing. Right, well I think now it's time, uh, because it's the car guys, we need to give it some beans, don't we? So here we go, are you ready? inside this this would be the best car in the world what a thing this is what a thing oh, look we're going past the funeral electric mode see respectful past the funeral other side of the church away we go probably the only other thing that I can say that I really don't like about this car is the price it's very, very expensive. This car cost well in excess of 300,000 pounds. And this is kind of supposed to be the entry level Ferrari now. My 458 Italia, when I bought it, was 205,000 pounds spec. And this, way over 300. It's just too much. And I understand, Ferrari, that you kind of need to do that in order to remain exclusive and in order to ensure that you can meet demand, but it's just too much. And I'm really not sure that £26,000 for the Assetto Fiorano pack is worth the money at all. Because remember, you don't really get anything different with the engine, it's just all cosmetic and aerodynamic. But overall, I have to say that the 296 GTB has been an absolute revelation to me. You know me, I am one of those proper old school Ferrari fans that hates the idea of hybrid, hates the idea of electrification. And the thing that I've come away from having driven David's car now, thank you very much again, David, is I really don't need to fear the future. Ferrari has got me covered. It's just a spectacular experience merging these powertrains so seamlessly and still retaining the Ferrari-ness, but I have to admit it, that's exactly what they've done. This is an epic, epic, epic car. It already makes the 488 feel ancient. The F8, unfortunately, being a sort of interim car, is also now really dated compared to this. This is the new benchmark as far as I'm concerned. And on that car guy, mind-bending bombshell, back to the studio. Thank you for watching this episode on the Ferrari 296 GTB, which I absolutely loved. If you like what we're doing on the car guys, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another episode next week.